Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fernando Gago. I lead innovation at uh, Kaleido. Thank you very much for making me part of this event. Uh, and what I want to do today is share with you pretty much a story. Okay. This is a story of a traditional logistics company and what we've learned over the past few years about playing with the startups. So this is us. This is Kaleido, a 40 plus year old logistics company, family owned, headquartered in uh, the northwest of Spain, the city of Vigo. And we have, we have always done innovation. Okay, we are actually quite well known in, in the sector for, for being innovative in the way we approach our projects. But um, up to recently, we were doing it uh, based on, let's call it a traditional R&D model. That is a team of engineers working in multi-annual projects, uh, maybe together with a university or a tech center, uh, having to comply with uh, projects of middle that was maybe awarded public funding for three or four years, having to imagine at year one what the market would want at year four. And we were quite successful with the strategy in terms of attracting projects, but uh, we were not completely satisfied with the rate at which those projects were turning into realities in the market for our business units or clients to use. And at the same time, we were witnessing this uh, whole new ecosystem going on into, into the B2B space the startup ecosystem with its different pace and dynamics and uh, prototyping and proof of concepts and continuous contact with the market, trial and error and so forth. And we started thinking that we might learn something from that, right? Uh, that in order to achieve our innovation goals, we needed to start playing that game, this whole open innovation game. And that is how Kaleido Tech was born. So it was not an R&D department anymore. It was its self-standing entity within the group, fully devoted to the open innovation concept. So the logic here is quite simple, really. We started by accepting and acknowledging that if we wanted to be relevant in all the technologies that we thought could have an impact in logistics, uh, it would be very hard to do it fully internally because no matter how smart we thought we were, chances are that the top tech and the top teams uh, were somewhere else in the world. So we would be better off setting up the tools that would enable us to, to work with these, with these top tech teams around the world on a, on a, let's say, mutual interest collaboration, right? So what tools are there? How, how do corporates and, and startups uh, can work together? This is a general overview of the different models. Uh, if we go around that circle from the very light color to the black, starting in increasing level of involvement. As a corporation, you can just attend events and do some PR. Uh, you can join an instructor program, like an accelerator or similar. Uh, you can even uh, start your own one or, or, or enter a third party one as a, as a partner. That's, that's how we started. Uh, you can go one step further and, and, and purchase the products and services of, of the startups. So become a client that is a procurement based relationship. You can go one step farther and, and get your hands a little more dirty and, and, and start uh, developing something together, cor corporation and startup that you both own. This is the co-development model that we feel quite comfortable with. And then you can go one step further or at least go into the pure financial uh, uh, side and, and invest, become a shareholder in the company. Uh, my, my fellow speakers this morning know much more than, than myself about this, or you can go all the way and, and acquire the, the, the company, the technology, the infrastructure, and so forth. The numbers here are not important. Uh, this is just to tell that all, pretty much all the top European corporations are already doing one or many of these strategies. So it's something that it's already there and happening. But back to our story. So we launched a program. Uh, we launched a program six years ago, so it's now the seventh edition. And we focused a lot on the co-development model because that's what fitted at best. So what is it? Uh, we find uh, what we think is the best team developing a specific technology that we think has an application in logistics. And we get the core of that technology and all our knowledge of the industry needs. And together we build something unique uh, that we bring to the market. We'll see examples later on. So for us, uh, it is a way of getting a technology that would take us forever to develop internally 
for the startup. It's a way of accessing a new market segment, a new ecosystem that maybe was not on the roadmap. And something happened along the way, something funny, that uh, some of the clients that uh, were uh, discovering those products that we were able to, to bring into the market through this strategy, uh, they asked us for the strategy itself. They asked us how were we doing it in order to, to, to start fueling this, this new funnel of, of, of developments. And we share with them this story that I'm sharing you, with you today, this methodology. And, uh, and they asked us for help. They said, could you help us out doing something similar in our industry? So we currently run four programs, uh, of course, in logistics, serving our group and other logistics companies. Also in the fishing industry, habitat, which is architecture and uh, construction, and aquaculture. So four different verticals, four different industries, making use of the same methodology and the same ecosystem we've been nurturing for the last few years. Uh, I will mention a little bit about this multi multi sector approach later on. So uh, you will for sure have heard about accelerators and, and corporate innovation programs and so forth. They are pretty much everywhere now. So uh, I wouldn't dare to say that there is a right methodology, but I can share what has worked for us and our clients in the past in case uh, it is useful. So our very personal specific approach to it, okay? So we don't offer uh, any funding by default for a startup to participate in our programs. We don't require them to give out any equity either. Of course, a direct investment is an opportunity and it's on the table, but it's not all a requirement to be part of the program. Why? Well, the reason is that we don't think it is the right attracting tool. Okay, uh, we don't want in the program those startups that go from program to program just getting funding but not really focusing on developing something real in the market. At the same time, we don't want to leave out of the program those that have interest in technology and impact, but because of whatever reason in their current shareholder status, they cannot accept us as investors. So for us, it's better to focus on the use case and then we build a relationship around it. Uh, we are flexible there, it's secondary in our case. Second, along the same lines, uh, we don't force any curriculum uh, to the startups and the founders for being part of our program. Of course, we can put them uh, together with an industry expert if they need uh, at, some, at some point, but uh, we've seen that most of the successful cases in our programs are led by businessmen and women who really know what their market plan is and what the, they don't need business plan uh, help, they don't need a canvas, they don't need that sort of thing. What they need is to be seated with the right industry counterpart and start working on, on our solution. And I am not saying that this type of service is not useful. I mean, it is, but uh, in our opinion for our earlier stage. So we look at uh, somehow mature startups and, and, and this is more for, for an incubator, right? In our, in our opinion, so we don't force it. Deep dive into the tech aspects, I mean, we are the former R&D department of a logistics company. We are a bunch of engineers who like our engineering. Uh, but most importantly, we have come to the conclusion that uh, the only way in which we can provide uh, a good service to our business units in bringing them technology and our clients is by understanding the challenges as good as themselves, as, the challenge, as a challenger himself or herself. Um, so we spend a lot of time asking questions, understanding what has been tried, to solve the challenge before, why it worked, why it didn't work, the constraints. And we don't think it's enough at all to go with a general you know, description of a challenge because we need to really talk in their name to tech people and we really need to understand and get very deep into the details. The active scouting. Um, so this is not about, in our case at least, about you know, a corporation posting a few challenges and, 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 and waiting for startups to, to participate in the program and help them out. Uh, is the other way around. It is the corporation that chases the startups and convince them to participate. Because, you know, the, the best teams, the top talent, the top technology is not idle, you know, refreshing their browser, seeing which corporation needs help and filling out application forms. They are busy, they are sought after, and you have to really uh, convince them that there is, a, you know, a, benef a benefit for them in participating in your program. So our, our team, my team spends a lot of time uh, identifying who we think is the best and then reaching out and convince them to, to work with us. The cross-industry applications, this is what I mentioned before about the different programs. So being innovative doesn't necessarily mean being the first one who come up with some, something and builds it from a scratch. Sometimes it means being the first one who realizes something has been applied on a different industry and with a certain adjustments, it can be applied in mind. 
And we are seeing, based on that premise, many startups jumping from program to program along those different industries, those different verticals that I mentioned. And we are quite happy about that. Okay. So this was sort of like the trademark of our program. I'm going to now share a couple of specific uh, cases, not to get into the details of them, of course, but to sort of settle in the concepts we've seen so far. And also, you know, to, to, to explain a little bit the type of collaboration, not the details of the solution, of course. So this was one of the first results of one of our first editions. It's a intelligence flat, uh, platform for sea freight traffic. We got together with a German startup. They would provide us the raw data through their connection and integration with the systems of all the main carriers worldwide. And after that information was crossed with the port terminal of, uh, information and the satellite information, uh, we build on top of that the intelligence platform, which consists of all the alerts, all the predictive tools, all the uh, reports and analytics and so forth, based on what we know that a logistics manager would want to see in order to make better decisions. Since then, it's a project, it's a project that we've been selling to our clients and, and, and improving with the feedback, right? This second one, uh, on a later edition, we got together with a startup that was developing uh, GPS for interior, let's call it. So imagine you are on an airport or you are on a hospital and you need Google style navigation in order to reach your voting gate or your appointment room. This is what this guy did. And we looked at it and said, well, that's interesting. But wouldn't it also be interesting to have the real-time locations of all the moving assets on a warehouse or a factory, which is more our world, right? So we talked to them about an industrial application of their solution. We were looking at or thinking of, you know, getting distance covered, level of usage, whether or not uh, the forklifts were going through a restricted area, areas where there were multiple crossings for risk of collision, and they had to adjust their core technology, their algorithm to fit. Uh, a, a forklift because a forklift is faster than a human and goes back and forth and so forth. And we focused again on the on the platform, on the KPIs, on everything we knew that the plant manager, the warehouse manager would be looking at, but in this case, based on real data. Okay, so enough of our story. Um, now let's imagine that you're a corporation and you decided to join one program, uh, whatever fits you, whatever methodology, you start working in these structured programs to, to develop solutions with the startups. And um, what I want to share now is some learnings from our experience, not trying to be pretentious, just quite the opposite, sharing some of the things that we've seen ourselves and others do wrong. Uh, so, so maybe you can avoid it in the future. So your business units need to be eager for the solution and for the results. So if you start seeing that it is the innovation department or general management that are the only ones who are pushing for a project, for an innovation project, then start to worry. Because uh, if the end user, if the actual business unit who would benefit from the solution is not excited about it, at some point throughout the process, they would get sidetracked with their daily responsibilities and the project would just lose momentum. So it really needs to be something that has an impact on the daily, on the daily basis something that is important for them. Uh, a stone in their shoe, we call it in, in, in Spanish. I don't know if that applies. Anyway, it's also important to, to make sure you have top management support on this strategy. This is an unconventional process for many companies. You start dealing with uh, you know, small tech companies that your risk uh, assessment team has never heard of that might not comply with whatever policies you have in accepting providers. You need to give them information that you maybe not used to give out. You need to approve a small budgets for pilots. So all these things cause some sort of trouble in a traditional company. So if CEO and ownership are pushing, all these little changes tend to go much smoother. Okay, uh, this is a bit controversial one, but um, there's probably lawyers in the room and uh, or listening. And let me start by saying that uh, appreciate your job uh, very much. Um, now I've seen cases in which negotiating a small pilot takes way more time than the pilot itself. And that is, in my opinion, uh, a bit of nonsense. Uh, why? If you try to cover uh, an opportunity that hasn't even started developing, that is something that is so only on someone's mind. 
with a lot of restrictions such as uh, confidentiality, very harsh confidentiality, uh, exclusivity, penalties, and so forth. Um, this startup is going to get anxious and tired and it's going to go somewhere else. And I mean, it just makes sense to try to protect yourself in every scenario. We just think the approach or the approach that makes more sense is start with something simple, stating the, the, the intentions, and then a lot of milestones in the future where you sit together and build more complexity, more clauses to the contract when you have some reality to protect, right? It's uh, a bit of taking a small leaps of faith, but it's far more operative in our experience. Treat a startup like equals means that their time is as valuable as yours. And if it's not, then maybe it's because you are not dealing with the right startup. They cannot lose their time. So you have to make sure that if you get into one of those collaborations, you prioritize communication with them. You are not making them any favor. If you are not seeing the potential of the, of the collaboration at some point, by keeping it alive, for the sake of letting them have your logo on a presentation for, for investors, something like that, you are not doing them any favor. Uh, that's not that much value if there's not a business behind it, trust me. So if that's the case, just be straight, tell them this is no value for us and let them go somewhere else because their time is valuable, okay? Behave as much as, as, much as possible as a startup. This sounds sort of like cliche, you know, corporations have to be agile and lean and, and, and so forth, but it really helps to have inside people who, inside the corporation, people who know how a young tech company works. Um, and if I might add something, hiring former entrepreneurs <coughs> sorry, might be a good strategy for a startup, for corporations that want to get into this, into this game. And that's pretty much it, what I wanted to share. Um, there is a lot to gain uh, with, for corporations and for startups working together. If you think about it, there is not that much to lose. This is just about wanting to be better and accepting a little bit of uncertainty in order to do so. So for those of you who are not there yet, I hope this was somehow encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Applause from the audience for your insights. I have a very small question. Uh, what would be the rate? Uh, how many of uh, your like pitches or initial contacts goes into the contract stage, and then out of these uh, contracted startups and uh, well, well, cases uh, exits successfully? Okay, so I'm afraid I cannot give you like a one answer uh, like a one one word answer but uh, so our approach is particular in the sense that we are not uh, typical investors so we don't talk in terms of uh, contracting uh, investment uh, and then exiting so we are not a, a venture capital firm we don't have a corporate venture capital what we do what we call a success in where we enter a commercial agreement with a startup and we start mm -hmm. distributing together a product so we typically don't enter into the shareholding we've done uh, this in a small basis, but it's not our typical. But if we call actually getting into commercial agreements, uh, having a flow of funds in between us and the startup, so together obtaining revenue from the market, which is what, what, what we aim at, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that uh, the funnel is, uh, you know, uh, it is, it changes a lot from year to year, but if I want to take like regular terms, we, we might, you know, have between 10, 12 challenges every year, every year. For that, we scout, I'd say, about maybe 60 to 80 companies. We then uh, filter usually one, maybe two for each challenge, no more than that. And out of that, I would say less than half for sure end up into a real product. So if you make the numbers, we might be talking at the end from the people we start contacting to maybe a 10% that we end up having a relationship and we sell together a product or, 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 or co-develop something. So that's, that's more or less, I know it's not a very uh, mathematical answer, but, uh, but that's how, how it works in our case. Still, it's, it's very, you know, clearing the situation. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Fernando, and uh, we hope that you can stay with us a bit longer. I will. Thank you.